Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, the consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome to Nerve Puzzle number six. This case is purely hypothetical and any resemblance to any individual patient is purely coincidental. Let's start with a clinical scenario. We have a 32-year-old lady who is a right-handed executive and has a six-month history of tripping on curbs with numbness on the top of the left foot. Symptoms are present all the time and it's not clear if and when it gets worse. On clinical examination, there's no obvious wasting in the leg, tone is mildly reduced when moving the left ankle, power is weak, 4 plus out of 5 on dorsiflexion, but is normal on inversion. Sensation showed reduced pinprick to the dorsum of the foot, but there's lateral sparing and also no involvement of the sole of the foot either. Let's consider the differential diagnosis here. Could this be an individual nerve problem? Well, if we think about the perineal nerve, certainly, absolutely it could be. We've got sensation loss on the dorsum of the foot. We've got weakness of dorsiflexion. Those would all fit in with the perineal nerve lesion. Could it be a tibial nerve lesion? No. We've got no involvement of the side of the foot, which would be the sural nerve. We've got no involvement of the sole of the foot either, in terms of the sensation. We've got no weakness of ankle inversion, which would be from the tibius posterior muscle. And so the tibial nerve seems to be intact. For argument's sake, could this be a higher lesion of the perineal nerve? The answer is, yes, it could be. If we think about the sciatic nerve, it's made up of a number of divisions. We've got the perineal division, we've got the tibial division, and sometimes the perineal division of the sciatic nerve can be preferentially involved in various pathologies, and uh, that could certainly be a cause over here which needs consideration. Could this be a higher up lesion, for example, in the lumbar sacral plexus? Well, in theory it could be, but to just to pick off perineal nerve would be fairly unlikely, although possible. Um, could this be a radiculopathy? Well, yeah, it could certainly be an L5 radiculopathy. That's certainly in the differential here. However, we have got strong ankle inversion, and therefore that would argue against that because that actually has L5 innervation. Could this be some musculoskeletal problem? That's very unlikely. Let's consider the neurophysiology now. So if we have a look at the sensory nerve action potentials, so on the right side, we've got 26 and 15 for the sural and superficial perineal responses respectively, and those are very normal, very healthy at those levels. If we look at the affected limb, the sural nerve is mimicked uh, to the right side. It's 25 microvolts, that's the same. However, if we have a look at the superficial perineal nerve, there's definite asymmetry there. It's very reduced. It's only 2.3 microvolts compared to the 15 on the right-hand side. Let's have a look at the motor action potentials. So if we start off with the EDB, the extensor digitorium brevis responses, on the left-hand side, well, we can see a normal distal motor latency, and that's symmetrical to the right. We can see normal conduction in the portion between the fibular neck and the ankle of 47 meters per second. And again, that's symmetrical to the right side. If we have a look at the portion between the popliteal fossa and the fibular neck, well, that's slow. It's 33 meters per second. If we have a look on the right hand side, that's 64 meters per second. So there's significant slowing. Let's have a look at the motor amplitudes now. 1.2 on the left versus 5.6 on the right. So there's been a fair amount of external loss here too. And if we have a look at the portion of the popliteal fossa stimulation, compare that to the fibular neck, we can see this conduction block too. The F latency has also prolonged on the left with 56 uh, milliseconds compared to 46 on the right hand side. Let's have a look at the posterior tibial uh, studies and have a look at the AH motor responses. Well, we've got a normal distal motor latency for both sides. We've got normal motor amplitudes and we've got normal F latencies as well. And so what we can see from this aspect is that we've got clear conduction slowing and block across the fibula neck on the left hand side. In terms of the EMG, well, I could certainly put in more uh, muscles uh, in this scenario, but I think it's important to focus your mind in terms of what's important here. The most important things to consider is the tibialis anterior muscle. Here we can see fibrillations and evidence of moderate denervation and the left tibialis posterior EMG was entirely normal. Let's put this all together now. So we've got a reduced sensory response on the left for the superficial perineal response. We have also got a reduced EDB motor response with clear conduction slowing across the fibula neck. And on EMG, we've got clear denervation in tibialis anterior and normal tibialis posterior 
findings. And therefore, in conclusion, what we have here is a moderate and active left common perineal nerve lesion across the fibular neck. Let's consider a couple of clinical points now. The first one is it's always important to check ankle inversion strength. If there is normal ankle inversion, then we are only really considering a problem with the perineal nerve. However, if there is weakness, then that implies involvement of tibial nerve fibers or um, problems up at the L5 uh, root level. And it's really important to differentiate between the two. Of course, there's a very wide differential for any type of foot drop. And I have a, a separate uh, video explaining all the different causes of that. And you can link to that on the iCard above. A final point I really want to stress is that patients with foot drop are at increased risk of falling. I can't emphasize that enough. And before you send your patient out of your office, if they presented you for the first time with this, I really want you to consider three things for them. And that is their flooring, their footwear and foot splints. Flooring, because if there's any unevenness on the floor, if there are any uh, rugs or anything loose that they may trip over, well, that really is a, something that can precipitate a fall for them. Their footwear, you need to make sure if they've got slippers, that they're not old slippers, they aren't splitting of their soles, which can also add to their falls risk. And foot orthoses, um, something to keep the ankle upright and so that the foot shouldn't drag on the floor uh, is really important. Please do sort that out before you sort out any other test. A couple of neurophysiological points here. Um, we really want to make sure that we're dealing with a lesion of the perineal nerve in this kind of circumstance below the fibular neck. And so there are a couple of ways which we can do this. Everybody knows um, about the EMG of the short head of the biceps. So that's a branch of the perineal nerve above the fibular neck. Um, another way of doing this is looking at the sensory response of the lateral cutaneous nerve of the calf. So here is an anatomical guide to where the lateral cutaneous nerve of the calf comes from. If you wanted to test this, it's really simple to test. And what you do is you stimulate two centimeters medial and four centimeters proximal to the fibular neck. And you put your recording leads 12 centimeters distally towards the calcaneum. So thank you very much for watching this clip. I hope you found it useful. I hope you just found some interesting things to consider there, both from an a clinical point of view and also from a neurophysiological point of view. If you have found this useful, please really do support this channel by clicking on the subscribe, click on the like, and please do share with your friends and colleagues. It really does help this channel grow and supports my work. So thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you on my next video.